A day of walkouts and demonstrations for safety on school campuses. How kids in Oceanside have made this a weekly event. And the decision that will help students at SDSU and other state universities afford their tuition. I'm Beth Accomando, KPBS arts reporter, and I am here at the Frankenstein Cafe at San Diego Comic Fest, and I'll be speaking with its chairman, Matt Dunford. My name is Harmony. My main objective is to be a good companion for you, bringing happiness and fulfillment to your life. And a San Marcos company is developing artificial intelligence as a form of human companionship. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. Students at at least a dozen area schools walked out of class today. It's part of another nationwide demonstration against gun violence, this time coinciding with the 19th anniversary of the Columbine shooting. KPBS education reporter Megan Burks went to Oceanside this morning where students have been staging weekly protests since the beginning of March. About a dozen El Camino High School students have gathered on the sidewalk outside of school each Friday for eight weeks. What do we want? Gun reform! When do we want it? Now! They wave signs in support of gun legislation. One reads, Honk for School Safety. <laughs> they say the goal is persistence. We haven't really seen any substantial change in government action, so. We knew that if we stood out here every week, they'd see a constant of like, they really do want something. So just in hopes of something actually happening for once. The organizers are sure to bring enough signs for newcomers to join. The school's black student union started picking them up when it noticed few black students participating in the walkout on March 14th. The same week, uh, it was a Stefan Clark shooting and it's like, we, we know that there's always going to be another hashtag. We know that he's not the last victim, and we know there's definitely going to be more. There have been more already. And um, so we decided we wanted to do a walkout, and we wanted our voices to be heard. More justice, more peace. No racist police. The students plan to leave their classrooms later in the school day to read speeches and observe a moment of silence. 15 people died in the shooting at Columbine High School in 1999. Not for guns and deportation. Megan Burks, KPBS News. The San Diego region remains one of the safest metro areas in the nation, according to a new report by Sandag, with one crime reaching a record low. The annual regional crime report shows burglaries are at their lowest level since 1980, when Sandag started the annual reporting. These numbers are from 2017. 80 homicides were reported, a drop of 21 percent. Some violent crimes, including robbery and domestic violence, saw increases in the single digits. San Diego County is stepping up its fight against Alzheimer's disease with the help of a federal grant. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy says the grant comes as new research shows the, dis the disease is escalating in our region. Inside the Conrad Previs Center for Chemical Genomics, scientists in white lab coats are seeking medical breakthroughs and drug discoveries. A key focus, neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's. Ann Bang is director of cell biology. For instance, uh, using uh, patient-specific stem cells uh, to produce disease-relevant cell types like neurons from Alzheimer's patients. The center is part of a collaborative project receiving a $1.3 million federal grant aimed at bolstering research to find a cure. San Diego County leaders and brain scientists gathered just outside the center to announce the funding and share daunting new statistics. 84,000 people in San Diego County have the disease or related dementia, and that number is expected to soar 36 percent by the year 2030. Nationally, Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death 
in San Diego County, it's the third leading cause of death. Senior epidemiologist Leslie Upledger Ray says San Diego has a booming senior population, and the progressive disease will put an enormous strain on the health care system, families, and the economy because patients require 24 hour care. That average is $64,000 a year. Upledger Ray says those costs are generally not covered by health insurance. One out of every 10 San Diegans over the age of 55 is afflicted with Alzheimer's or a related dementia. That's a huge burden. Right now, there's no cure for Alzheimer's. Gerald Chun of the Sanford Burnham Previs Medical Discovery Institute says a more realistic short-term goal is making the disease more tolerable. To slow the progression would be great. Uh, a lot of agents are designed to treat the symptoms, the signs and symptoms of the disease. So, for example, to improve cognition. Uh, that, that is one endpoint that's being looked at actively. So there's a range of different possibilities. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he will introduce a bill to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level. 30 states have legalized marijuana for medical or recreational use, but the federal government still puts the drug in the same category as heroin. In a statement released today, Schumer says a staggering number of American citizens, a disproportionate number, whom are African American and Latino, continue to be arrested every day for something that most Americans agree should not be a crime. And California lawmakers are trying to create a specialty licensed banks for marijuana businesses. The banks would issue checks to pay taxes, rent and vendors. Right now, these businesses are cash only, which poses a security risk. A state Senate committee approved a bill this week, but there are a few more steps to go. The bill is gaining traction now that the Trump administration says it will not crack down on states where voters have legalized marijuana. It's described as a friendly, intimate comic convention, and it's happening this weekend in San Diego. Comic Fest 2018 features local and national comic book artists and writers. They're all at the Town and Country Resort in Mission Valley. That's where KPBS arts and culture reporter Beth Accomando is tonight. I'm here at the dealer's room at San Diego Comic Fest, and we have San Diego Comic Fest chairman Matt Dunford. Oh, little old me? That's right. So tell us, this is billed as the friendlier, kind of smaller version of Comic Con. What's that all about? So here at San Diego Comic Fest, we're celebrating our sixth year, and it's a small, intimate convention, but it still has a lot of activity. It's got a lot of things going on. So we're showcasing a lot of things, for example, 200 years of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, as you can demo seat right here, having a nice little party for Frank. But we also, well, you know, we focus on comics and animation and film and science fiction and all the geeky things on a smaller scale in a more controlled environment. So that way, it's just friendly, it's nice, it's wonderful because you're running into your friends all the time. You're running into the people who made the, you know, your favorite comics and your favorite cartoons and it's just so cool because you could just come up and just hang out with these people. In bigger conventions, it tends to be a more intimidating setting, and so people get overwhelmed, they freak out, I don't know what to do. And sometimes when you want to ask a question of these big celebrities or writers, you go up in front of a panel in front of a mic and say, hi, I, um, I love your work. And it, that, when you're saying a question like that in front of 2,000 people, it's kind of scary. But here when you do it just in a casual setting, it's fun and it's nice and it just takes the edge off. And I just, I just want everyone to have a good time here. And I understand you are on some panels yourself and you are having a little bit of a geeking out on these panels. You know, I'm geeking out right now because, well, I just got off hosting a spotlight on the spotlight of John Semper, and John Semper wrote the Spider-Man cartoon back when I was a kid, which was my all-time favorite cartoon. He worked on Muppet Babies and Fraggle Rock and a number of Jim Henson cartoons back in the day, and so I'm feeling pretty euphoric right now. And people can also go down Artist Alley and actually look at some artwork and even have some custom art done. Uh, yes, there's a lot of custom artwork going on right now, so if you want, go up to Artist Alley, which is on the ninth floor with, next to our Frankenstein Cafe. It's really cool, so you can just go up and just get some custom artwork, one-of-a-kind thing. I always recommend, you know, why get something that anyone else could do when you can just have an artist create something all your own? And we've also got a great thing going on this weekend for our auction. A lot of artists have taken some pairs of 
knock around sunglasses, drawn on really cool custom pairs. They're going to be drawn on some custom ones, everything from Frankenstein to mummy patterns. So if you want to feel you know, cool with some shades or whatnot, just uh, come to our charity auction and get some custom sunglasses, custom artwork, get toys, get whatever. I just want you loving this stuff and coming out here and loving comic conventions as much as I do. And we do have some celebrities here on the floor that you might like to meet. Including Sarah Karloff, who is Boris Karloff's daughter. Uh, if it weren't for the fans, I'd stay home and clean my own oven. The fans are wonderful. They're so respectful of the legacy that my father left. And he was one of the very few people in the business about whom nothing negative was ever written or said. That's remarkable in and of itself. Sarah Karloff has a presentation tomorrow at 1 p.m. I'm Beth Accomando, KPBS Arts Reporter, and San Diego Comic Fest continues through Sunday here at the San Diego Town & Country. College students in the CSU system will not have to pay more for their education next year. The CSU chancellor is dropping a proposal to raise tuition by several hundred dollars. Instead, the CSU system, will, which includes San Diego State University, will ask the state legislature for more funding in the state budget. Undergrad tuition is currently $4,700 a year. The cost of tuition impacts the cost of living for many college students. In a recent study, 36% said they're food insecure, meaning they struggle to pay for basic items. AP reporter Michael Hill shows us how colleges are trying to meet that need. College student Hannah Denou has a place to go when grocery money runs short. Schenectady County Community College is among a growing number of schools that have on-campus food pantries stocked with staples. The pantry leaves her more time to focus on studies. You are stressing about so many different things, um, your grade point average, trying to keep up in all your classes. And if you're worried about food too, it's just more and more that you have to take on. Campus food pantries have caught on amid rising college costs, stagnant family incomes, and a poor part-time labor market. A survey published this month by the University of Wisconsin found thousands of U.S. students reported dealing with hunger issues, and that can threaten academic success. And you can't concentrate when you're hungry. You're just thinking about food, you're angry, you're irritable, you're not focusing, and I did not perform well on some exams. This upstate New York college opened its pantry more than a year ago. Any student can visit up to three times a month and select three days' worth of food. It fills the gap between uh, the, the money that they have to allocate for food and um, those times of the month when it runs out. There are an estimated 570 campus food pantries across the country. More are in the works. All University of California campuses now have food pantries. New York this month became the first state to mandate free food pantries on all its public campuses. At the borough of Manhattan Community College, officials say the soon-to-open pantry will help both students and the school. It's not only that students are hungry, but we're looking at our retention and graduation rates. Denu is studying biology as she works towards becoming a veterinarian. She says the pantry has made her path to graduation a bit easier. Michael Hill, Associated Press. I'm Judy Woodruff. Tonight on the News Hour, the Democratic Party sues the Trump campaign, Russia, and WikiLeaks for interfering in the 2016 election. Coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. Southwest Airlines is compensating passengers who were on a plane that made an emergency landing this week in Philadelphia. One of the engines exploded during flight, debris shattered a window, and a woman died when she was partially sucked out of the plane. One of the passengers on the plane says Southwest mailed a handwritten letter from the CEO with a $5,000 check and a $1,000 travel voucher as a gesture of apology. A warning about this next story, which may not be appropriate for all audiences. From Siri to Alexa, artificial intelligence is one of the fastest growing trends in tech. And now a San Marcos company called Real Dolls is applying it to human sexuality. KBBS arts and culture reporter Beth Accomando took a tour of the facility and spoke with Real Dolls creator and CEO.
walking through Real Dolls production facility is like entering the uncanny valley. You know, that place where things look almost human, but not quite. So this is the production line here. Um, these are all dolls that are in production, and they're in varying stages. Normally they get uh, first demolded out of the molds, and then see all these little bits of silicone because somebody had the wonderful task of going around with a little tiny pair of scissors and trimming it all off. It's actually painstaking and very important. These are the body molds here. So they, they put the skeleton inside and then the liquid silicone gets poured into the mold. We have some sticky, icky gels. These are really soft uh, gelatinous silicone that we put inside of the doll's bodies um, in those areas that are meant to be softer, such as breasts or the buttocks of the doll. Matt McMullen is CEO of Real Doll, and he makes sex dolls. My name is Harmony. And now he's giving them artificial intelligence. I have a dynamic artificial intelligence that learns through interaction. I partnered with some other tech companies to create a system that is comprised of an artificial intelligence engine that's customizable so you can create a, a unique personality and it can be connected to a robotic head. We're excited because I think it's going to give people the ability to rather than imagine a personality for their doll, they'll actually be able to be part of the creation of that personality. What would you prefer to wear tonight? A thong or panties for nothing at all? We turned her sex all the way up so that's why she's gonna try to talk dirty. Whether you call them robots, androids, or sex dolls, pop culture has always been fascinated by the potential benefits, as well as possible dangers, posed by machines with AI. Not so much the technology that's to be feared, it's the intent behind it. And for us, a lot of our focus is on people who benefit from having a presence in their life, who can't find the way to sort of bond with another human being or for whatever reason they choose not to. Fate led McMullen to the sex doll industry. He was an artist who worked for a Halloween company and learned how to make masks and work with silicone. Then at some point I decided I wanted to make a life-sized sculpture. In a sense, I was looking at it like a very realistic mannequin that was posable and looked real enough that people would look twice. And that compelled some people to ask if it was anatomically correct. At first, I dismissed it as not what this is, but you know, I saw an opportunity to do what I love doing and make a living doing it. But not everyone is comfortable with the idea of sex dolls. Imagine me using one. Just, OK, go there. That's absurd. <laughs> And that's how most people probably feel about sex dolls. Mention sex dolls, and you often get a knee-jerk reaction of laughter or disgust. That doesn't surprise family therapist David Peters. The anger or uh, animosity that people show really is a reaction to their anxiety about it. Peters says we don't really know much about sex doll users because they're a reclusive group that feels stigmatized by society. This has its own taboo still, and so it, people can have a feeling that you got to be really, really weird for that to be your thing that you're into. But let's keep in mind that only one generation ago, sex toys were only for perverts. Psychologist John McConnell also points to ever-changing attitudes on sex. Deviant used to mean anything that goes away from the norm of having heterosexual sex to have children. But now deviant sort of means anything that something would, somebody would do that I wouldn't do. In an odd way, that sensibility also drives McMullen. Ironically, coming from uh, a guy who runs a company that makes sex dolls, I have a moral compass. And so I, I don't want to make animals or children um, or anything that I find objectionable or, or just doesn't feel right. He makes both female and male adult dolls that range in price from $4,000 to $7,000 for the basic model. He ships an average of seven a week. A full AI robot is about $12,000, and a fully customizable one could run you 50 k But McMullen insists that what he creates is art. And somehow when something becomes any kind of a sex toy, it's, it's disqualified as art by many people, and I really beg to differ on that. He sees each doll as a work of art that he wants people to fall in love with. 
David Peters says one day sex doll users may be able to show that love more openly. We're in an age where virtually everybody's coming out of the closet with whatever proclivity they have and wanting to be accepted and, and this will find its next time in line. My main objective is to be a good companion for you. The first sex doll brothel just opened in Germany. So maybe the public is more willing to travel to the uncanny valley than we think. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Passing of Prop 64 made recreational pot legal in California. But in more cities than not, the marijuana business isn't welcome yet. A billionaire doctor is poised to take over at the San Diego Union Tribune and LA Times and a look back at the biggest health beat stories of the last couple decades. Join us for the KPBS Roundtable tonight at 8.30. It's going to be a quiet weekend with plenty of sunshine, and that will continue into next week. Justin Pavic has details in tonight's forecast. Well, we have some changes coming up over the course of the next couple of days. The wind already is lighter, and we're going to be talking about some milder temperatures going above normal. And then perhaps some more changes as we go down the line into next week. Check out the satellite and the radar of the last six hours. Not a whole lot going on. La Jolla and get out toward Ramona, also Oceanside and then points off to the east as well. Borrego Springs and Mount Laguna. Still a little bit of a breeze out there, but it's not nearly as high as it was again this point yesterday. And notice points off to the north LA right into the Bay Area. It's quiet, high pressures building into place and that will make for some quiet conditions. So as you can see on future cast here as we go throughout Saturday, we're not going to be talking about the rain. Overnight low temperatures drop into the mid 50s and again still a few clouds. We're not talking about any precipitation making its move on in though we could use it. Again, it has been a very, very dry month. Step out of the way here so you can see some of these overnight low temperatures. But I also want to mention that, you know, we've only seen a hundredth of an inch of precipitation. Again, in the San Diego Oceanside, just a tiny bit more than that. And you have to go all the way back to mid to late March to where you had a more beneficial rain. Notice we drop into the 40s for tonight and Chula Vista down to 51. Mount Laguna cooler into the higher terrain down to 42. We bounce back to 68 as we venture into tomorrow. Borrego Springs heating up into the 90s, but also notice San Diego, you're at 70. So that's a couple degrees above normal. It's just a week on shore flow. So temperatures close to normal at the immediate shoreline, but you move your way further inland. It is going to be quite warm and notice for coastal communities here as we go throughout the coming days, the onshore flow begins to strengthen eventually knocking down those numbers. We will have some morning low clouds and also some fog out there. We talk about the inland locations and eventually some of that fog coming into play as we venture into Tuesday and Wednesday, but it burns off and we'll have some sunshine. Mountainous locations peaking here on Sunday with some sun shine. The winds begin to stir up heading into Tuesday and also Wednesday of next week and desert locations becoming windy as we venture into next week as well. But lots of sunshine for KPBS News. I'm meteorologist Justin Pavic. Back over to you, Ebony. This weekend we celebrate some of San Diego's most beloved spaces and places. Here with more, it's KPBS Arts Calendar Editor Nina Guerin. Chicano Park Day is one of San Diego's favorite events a celebration of the park's social and artistic history. Back in 1970, the Barrio Logan community rose up and protested plans to build a police station at the park. That struggle, as well as issues the Mexican-American community continues to face, is what you see depicted on the park's many murals. At the celebration, There'll be Chicano music, folkloric dancing, a lowrider car show, food, crafts, and speakers from the local community. Another beloved San Diego spot will be honored this weekend, Sherwood Auditorium. Only this will happen inside a museum. A new exhibition inside the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego honors the history of the Sherwood Auditorium. It was recently torn down to allow for the La Jolla location's expansion. Artist Eve Laris Cohen grew up in San Diego and performed as a dancer at the theater. Now, he's recreated that space at MCASD downtown, and every Saturday, there'll be a secret performance that honors the building's rich community history. Finally, French musician Jean-Michel Jarre brings his iconic light and sound show to San Diego.
Jarre is known for his grand, record-breaking concerts. He performed in Houston for over one million people and for three and a half million in Moscow. He creates soundscapes and uses lasers and projections to enhance his electronic music. For this tour, the 69-year-old musician has a new laser harp, which is like a harp made out of lasers that he plucks and moves around with his hands. You'll have to see for yourself when Jarre plays the final show of his tour here in San Diego. For KPBS Arts, I'm Nina Guerin. Today marks the final day at KPBS for longtime health reporter Kenny Goldberg. Kenny is retiring after 20 years of reporting for KPBS on radio, television, and online. Over the years, his coverage has included international reporting on HIV and AIDS. His work has also been recognized with three Golden Mike Awards and other honors. He will be missed. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Finally, we leave you with the sounds of Phil Harmonic performing at Capitol Public Radio in Sacramento. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night. That we all wanna flex. I confess that as humans can be really complex. We flash our egos and we wanna call it heart in the leg. We show emotion and we think they're gonna think of us less.